We salute innovators who push the limits of science, changing how we see the world and ourselves. And growing up, Sally Ride read about the space program in the newspaper almost every day, and she thought this was the coolest thing around. The president decided that Sally deserved a Presidential Medal of Freedom. As the first American woman in space, Sally didn't just break the stratospheric glass ceiling, uh, she blasted through it. And, when and she... Obama also decided that I should be the one to accept the award, which also is like, oh my gosh, what is going on in our world? Finally, you know, don't I need to be secretive about who I really am anymore. And I just wished, you know, that Sally could experience what I experienced. Tam O'Shaughnessy accepting on behalf of her life partner, Dr. Sally K. Ride. For the United States of America, I christen thee, Sally Ride. May God bless this ship and all who sail in her. The ship is just sort of drop-dead gorgeous. So I'm happy, and, and I also have to say that when I see Sally's name, various places around the ship, it kind of, uh, you know, my heart does something. It's, it's a weird feeling. So it's happiness and, and a little bit of sadness, too. It still gets me. Wow. We both grew up in Southern California. My memory is meeting Sally in Redlands, California when I was 12 and she was 13. We were good friends during the junior tennis days and both of us traveled back east and of course up and down California playing the junior tennis tournaments. And then, you know, Sally went off to college. She was at Swarthmore for about a year and a half and then started to commit to physics and then went to Stanford. I played on the circuit for almost four years, and then when I left, I went to work in Northern California. And Sally was in school at Stanford, so then we reconnected and would go running in the Stanford Hills and play tennis in the morning before work and that sort of thing. I really wanted to study biology, so I moved to Atlanta. And, you know, a few months later is when Sally was, you know, eating scrambled eggs in this uh, Stanford Student uh, Union and looked at the student newspaper and saw that NASA was for the first time recruiting women to become astronauts. And the moment I saw that ad, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I ripped it out of the newspaper and I literally applied that afternoon. Um, turned out a lot of other people did the same thing. There were about 8,000 of us who applied to that, that opportunity and it was the first time that they were admitting women into the astronaut corps. Out of uh, that group, NASA picked 35 of us to be the first class of astronauts specifically selected for the space shuttle program. They called them the 35 new guys, uh, TFNGs, and there were six women, the very first women who were kind of officially astronauts, uh, and it was the class in 1978. And everybody kind of trained together and learned about the space shuttle you know, all of its systems. Um, when you're in space, how everything works. And then Sally got a really key assignment, which was to help design and build the robotic arm. So she got noticed there. And then because of that, she was named Capcom. And the Capcom is the only person down in Mission Control in Houston that speaks to the astronauts. And we appreciate all that. I think that gave us a lot of good data. So it was a critical role, and Sally got very high marks and got noticed for just how cool she was under pressure, how kind of concise she was in speaking to the astronauts and uh, relaying messages. And, you know, no one knows for sure how the decision got made, but the, the rumor is that she just sort of did things so well. And also, she was very easygoing. So she was very easy, actually, to get along with. So all those things, you know, uh, turned into Sally being 
the one named as the first American woman to fly in space in 1982 sometime. And then her crew worked together for about a year, and then she flew in June 1983, the, her first flight. Now, uh, Dr. Wright, during your, during your training exercises uh, as a member of this group, uh, when, when there was a problem, when there was a funny a glitch or whatever, uh, how did you respond? How do you take it as a human being? Do you, do you weep? Do you, um, what do you do? Why doesn't anybody ask Rick those questions? <laughs> it's, the commander weeps. <laughs> I don't think that I react any differently than uh, anybody else on the crew does. And do you feel that the coverage that has been given has been disproportionate with regards to the uh, first American woman in space? I think that it's uh, maybe too bad that our society isn't further along and that this is such a, such a big deal. But um, I guess if the American, the American public thinks that it's a big deal, then it's probably good that it's getting the coverage that it's getting. I think it's time, it's time that we get away from that and it's time that, that people realize that uh, women in this country can do any job that they want to do. Every astronaut uh, during the space shuttle days was allowed to invite 50 friends and family. I didn't get to see Sally because Sally was in quarantine, but I got to you know, experience the launch and uh, you know, be in the stands with Sally's mother and father and sister and it, you know, it was uh, quite an experience. On launch day, there was so much excitement and so much happening around us in the crew quarters, even on the way to the launch pad, going up the launch pad, you know, looking up and seeing, you know, this huge, you know, rocket that kind of sounds like an animal. You can kind of hear the gurgling and the hissing and, you know, it sounds like it's alive. There's so much going on, and of course, it's all new. The training really doesn't prepare you for launch morning, that I um, spent an enormous amount of effort just trying to stay focused. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We go for main engine start. We have main engine start, and the ignition. And liftoff, liftoff of STS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. That was my first chance to uh, strap into a rocket on the launch pad and go from a standing start to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half really fast minutes. When the rockets fire, you know, Sally realized, and all the astronauts know, I mean, she, she couldn't control anything. When the rocket fuel ignites, it, it has to explode and, and do what it's going to do until it burns out. There is nothing to do. Once the space shuttle's engines cut off and we were in orbit around Earth, it was my first chance to unbuckle, float weightless in the space shuttle. Weightlessness, by the way, is something that I recommend to all of you. It's, it's just fun. There's no other word for it. And then, of course, it was also my first chance to float over to the window and take a look down at the really spectacular view of the Earth below. She saw this fuzzy, thin, blue line, and she was like, you know, what? And then she instantly realized that was Earth's atmosphere. And she just, it was a surprise, it just how little, how thin, how fragile it looked. But that moment in space really made her kind of a true environmentalist. She just realized that our atmosphere, Earth's air, is all that protects us from the blackness, the vacuum of space, and whoa, we better, we better protect it. And Challenger. Back home, back to Earth. She flew her second mission October of 1984. And, uh, you know, she was a seasoned astronaut on that one. 
then she was assigned a third flight and started training for that flight. And then NASA sent her across the country to give talks to kids and corporate leaders and teachers and so on. So she started coming to Atlanta and, you know, we resumed our friendship and then over time it just, it, it turned into uh, something else. It became romantic. Um, and that was 1985. So anyway, Sally was assigned her third space shuttle flight. She came to visit me from Houston in Atlanta uh, for my birthday. And then she was actually flying home on January 28th. And the pilot told Sally that the uh, space shuttle Challenger had exploded and that all lives were, were lost. And they were her friends. And it was also uh, the flight with the first teacher to fly in space, Krista McAuliffe. So it was, you know, it was a, a national a major heartbreak and disaster. Immediately after the Space Shuttle Challenger um, blew up, um, you know, NASA stopped all operations, you know, because they needed to. And uh, Ronald Reagan was our president. He selected Sally to be on the investigation team, the Rogers Commission to figure out what went wrong and to fix it, make sure it never happened again. And NASA decided to open up an office of exploration and headquarters in Washington, D.C. And so once again, Sally was the one chosen to be the first director. And her experiences in space and seeing the Earth from above actually kind of fed into the very first report that she led the study group and the analysis of. It's called the Ride Report. And then in the meantime, she realized it was going to take NASA a long time to kind of get going again. And Sally loved to fly. She wanted to go in space. She didn't really want to just be an astronaut on the ground, you know, doing other work, important work, but it didn't interest her. So she decided to start thinking about returning to the university world as a professor. And UCSD just said, you know, we'll make you a full professor, you'll have tenure, and we expect you to do good work in physics again. You know, and Sally was a California girl, and so she decided UCSD was the perfect place for her. I was back in the South, and I had started a PhD program at the University of Georgia in ecology. But we had done a long-distance relationship for four years, and it, it was... Um, it was really hard on, on both of us. So uh, I joined Sally in 1989, the same year she started at UCSD. Sally had written one children's science book with her best friend from high school, Sue Oki, to space and back. It's about the space shuttle and how you go to space and some of the physics and so on. And we decided that we wanted to try writing uh, children's science books together. And we just learned a lot about how to write them, how to choose the photographs, how to think of the illustrations to help young people learn the science. And we just really enjoyed doing that. By that time, you know, I was a professor, she was a professor, so we had kind of nine to five jobs and then we'd do it in the evening or weekends uh, also. We started noticing the articles and the, the reviews about how American kids do in math and science, and we were just kind of appalled. So in 2001, Sally and I and three of our friends started Sally Ride Science, and our goal was put together programs for kids and teacher training for teachers, and then also keep writing books, but on a bigger scale that would be engaging, exciting, but accurate in all areas of, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, climate change, all the topics kind of across the board that kids need to learn. We started bringing in revenue through our uh, Sally Ride Science Festivals, one day events on college campuses across the country. And then we started publishing our books and we just kind of kept bootstrapping everything we could and in March 2011, we were just getting ready to launch our big book series with wonderful teacher guides and teacher training and so on. And so we, we went to San Francisco. We had a party to announce our books and Sally and I actually took a cab to the party and I noticed in the cab that Sally looked a little yellow. And she had said earlier, she didn't want to eat dinner, she didn't feel good. And so we, we flew back to San Diego the next morning 
Uh, we took a cab from the airport, dropped Sally off at her doctor's office near UCSD. I had the cab take me home, get the car, come back to the doctor's office. I parked the car and I'm getting out and walking into the doctor's office and Sally's coming out and I can just tell by her face that something's bad wrong. And uh, her doctor, Dr. Lopez, um, you know, she said, uh, Lopez says, I have a mass in my pancreas. And we're going right now to radiology up the hill, UCSD Medical, to have a, a CAT scan. And, you know, we were, you know, driving over kind of in a fog, and we were both just in shock. And I just, I just remember thinking that, oh, my God, you know, our, our lives are going to be different. Because he said you have a mass, and he also said that it was very likely she had pancreatic cancer. So, you know, we heard the C word, and uh, from the time she was diagnosed until the day she died, it was like 17 months. Shortly after Sally died, I'm in the office doing my work, learning how to be a good CEO, and uh, my assistant come up, comes over and says, you have a telephone call. And she said, it's the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Secretary Ray Mabus. I said, okay. Well, I'll take that call. And so I said hello to Secretary Mabus, and you know, he said the Navy was building two brand new research vessels, and they were naming one after Neil Armstrong, and they wanted to name the second one, uh, the other one, after Sally. And what did I think of that? And I just said, wow, you know, that it's, it's a research vessel, right? It's not a warship, because <laughs> you wouldn't like that. And, and he said, yes. And I said, that's fantastic. And then he told me it was going to be operated by Scripps, and then he said, there's one other thing I want to ask you. Would you be uh, kind enough to be the ship's sponsor? He explained that the research vessel Sally Ride is the first academic research vessel ever named after a woman. So most ship sponsors are the wives of the man whose name is honoring the ship. And so he said, we think it's appropriate as Sally's partner for you to be the ship's sponsor. And I was just kind of in shock. I mean, I was just kind of blown away. It's like, wow, don't ask, don't tell really is history. You know, this is unbelievable. You know, Sally, you know, it, it, Sally would have loved that moment. And Sally would love that this is a research vessel, state of the art, and just, you know, be so excited about the research that's going to be done the next 30, 40 years. A new ship like Sally Ride comes around once every 40 years. So this is a, a remarkably big deal for people here at Scripps. And I would say for Americans and American scientists. When we go to sea, we can do any kind of science. We can do geology, chemistry, physics, atmospheric physics. We study everything from the very inside of the Earth to up in the heavens. So many of the things that affect us on land have their roots in the oceans. From global climate change to the fate of pollutants, to the, the food that we eat, even the air we breathe, relies on a healthy ocean. We have to understand what's going on out here. Ships like Sally Ride make that possible. I love the new ship smell um, and all the uh, top of the line equipment that we have. It's also really exciting that it's named after Dr. Sally Ride. She has a great you know, legacy here in San Diego, uh, being a female scientist, getting to go to space, uh, be an explorer. I always wanted to be an explorer and uh, I still feel like a modern day explorer whenever I go out to sea. So Sally flew in space when you were one year, yep. one year old. Exactly. <laughs> she, was, she was there. Sally loved science. She loved research. That's what this vessel is all about is pushing the envelope, trying to learn more and more about the oceans, about how the atmosphere and oceans interact and work together and she would love that. But it's also about role models and providing more and more opportunities for girls, for people of color. So she loved all of that and devoted her life to it through our company and many other things she did. And then because she was a professor at UCSD, she was also the director of the California Space Institute and she had an office overlooking the Pacific at Scripps. And then I think the final cool piece is Margaret Linen. You know, Margaret's a, a renowned oceanographer, but 
not very many women have been able to be the head of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So that's so cool too. And it's just all of this coming together, it just, it's perfection. <laughs>